Hello, everyone. I'm Mira the Montessorian. I'm speaking to Susan Varsamis here today. She's in Maui. Hello, Susan. Hello. Aloha, everyone. So happy that you could join me. This is an episode of Montessori Talks, and we're going to talk to Susan about a holistic, a holistic approach to parenting and childhood. Susan is an expert and runs an amazing center out of New York, as well as a holistic center out of Maui. So you get the best of both worlds, childhood in the East Coast and kind of adulthood and everything on the, on the West, on the West Coast, in the middle of the ocean. So I thought we could chat about that. Sure. So um, our work in New York has been very interesting. I started out in early intervention and special education uh, 38 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when early intervention came around, I was involved in um, writing those first laws to make early intervention possible. Mm -hmm. And um, we started early intervention in New York and as I started working with children that um, had a diagnosis of autism, we started to see a lot of health issues, um, especially gastrointestinal. And the parents were reporting that their kids were um, very, very sick. Mm -hmm. it was constant diarrhea, constant constipation. They also spoke about um, you know, if their child defecated in the night, it would wake up the house and it would just be such a toxic smell. And, and they had concerns about that. And I'd worked with children for decades and had never um, experienced something that severe. Mm -hmm. So we decided in the 90s, early 90s, 1992, to send 35 stool samples to a lab. We didn't say who it was, of course. We just had uh, numbers 1 to 35. Mm -hmm. And they were all infants and toddlers um, with autism. Wow. And I remember the day as a special ed teacher when the lab called me back and said, who are these people? This isn't Crohn's disease. This isn't uh, some kind of gluten uh, illness in terms of uh, celiac. However, they have pathologically low levels of fecochymotrypsin in their stool, and we suspect they're not getting any protein up to the brain. Who are these people? Can they walk? Wow. Can, they, can they learn? And I said, well, actually, they're toddlers that were just diagnosed with autism. And I had just written a book called I've Just Been Told, and it was a parent's guide to understanding what to do when you just got the diagnosis of autism. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I didn't know what pathologically low levels of fecal chymotrypsin meant, so I asked right. for the version of that. And they basically said, you know, they're not getting any protein up to the brain, mm -hmm. and they have severe leaky gut and malabsorption issues. And that's when I decided I really wanted to learn more about holistic approaches because there were no medications that were being um, prescribed for this other than gastrointestinal things, and there's not a lot of that for young children. There were some enzyme therapies that were going on at the time that we started. But um, so anyway, I wanted um, a more holistic approach. So I left the public sector mm -hmm. to open up the Holistic Learning Center in New York, which really focused on special education and applied behavioral analysis and physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. But what was different was that we were, um, we hired staff a chiropractor who was a nutritionist and another integrative medicine nutritionist that could look at blood and urine and stool and hair samples and cheek lining and saliva to look at dna mm -hmm. and determine the discrepancies in their body and what we learned was that the more discrepant they were in their gut and their um, and their inability to get nutrition from the gut to the brain the more severely autistic they were on rating scales. Wow. And there was a direct correlation uh, with there. So we did some studies. We um, gave a group of kids, um, well, all the kids were tested to find out their severity of autism um, on a childhood autism rating scale. And then without me knowing who got intervention and who did not, so it would be a blind study. Um, some of the kids were given uh, some protocols, nutrition protocols to include pancreatic enzymes. And you know, the concept we used to think is you are what you eat, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's you are what you absorb. There you go. Okay. 
So um, we then um, have done lots of work to look at the biochemistry um, of the gut and look at um, neurotransmitters and see what's going on in the brain. And the team in New York um, and Connecticut does a really good job at that. Mm -hmm. and besides the, um, all of the intervention for children, we've done an enormous training. And um, I've developed a questionnaire for parents to say, tell me about all aspects of your child's day. Um, waking up, transitioning, changing mm -hmm. from things to non-preferred things, you know, eating meals, helping around the house, going to parties, having family over, birthday parties, holidays, bedtime routines, toothbrushing, right. handling the shower, handling being touched with shampoo, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, a million little questions. And then from there, when the parents identify their concerns, we have modules to teach parents how to become masters at these routines by setting up predictable and comfortable routines for our kids that might be very sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, some kids can't manage change well. Some kids are tactically defensive and can't manage a tag on the shirt or right. having bubbles in their eyes and, you know, becomes a much bigger deal for them. So mm -hmm. we have modules of parent training, which has been super helpful for a lot of our parents. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes it's just home stuff like toilet training and other st times it's community things such as managing um, yourself in an overstimulating environment like a birthday party or a wedding right. or a religious ceremony or um, well, teaching. even going to the grocery store sometimes <laughs> or the shopping yeah. mall. I mean, I get overwhelmed when I was in Houston this weekend and we went into a shopping center and I'm going, oh, <laughs> this is too much for me. I can only imagine. For, yeah. for children, how it's probably like feeling like that a lot uh, for some of them. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we've used a lot of holistic approaches. Um, we work very closely with parents according to the child's lab results because some families say, oh, I'll go gluten-free, I'll go casein-free, I'll try this diet. But, you know, it's sort of like taking insulin without even knowing if you're diabetic. You know, right. it's, it's important to know the chemistry of the body and to tailor a program. And that's something that um, our other staff do that have medical backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And um, our students are doing very well and families that um, clean up the gut and put food into the body that is um, a good match to the chemistry of the gut mm -hmm. find that their children are really increasing and doing much better. And they're still needing their special education and their special right. therapy and their occupational therapy or whatever. But they're finding that the goals are being met much more quickly. I was going to say, yeah. And, the, and are um, they able to kind of be more present, be more focused for those sessions than before? Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, so that part's been really nice. And then for both the kids and parents, we're teaching mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, we're teaching kids to do deep breathing and to reflect on their behavior, uh, to do what we call social autopsies. Mm -hmm. um, and use social stories to okay. um, kind of analyze. So perhaps it might be um, I screamed and kicked the hair cutter. And well, what happened? Well, the buzz buzz machine came on my head and it made me uncomfortable. And, um, you know, I had no, I didn't know what to do. And so mm -hmm. that was my way of getting away. And then, well, what happened and how did you feel and how did the person feel and what could we do next time? Right. So we teach a lot of replacement behaviors to e teach kids to ask for a break, to teach kids to ask for a change of location, to say, stop, I need stop right now mm -hmm. uh, for something that's profoundly uncomfortable so it doesn't turn into an aggressive behavior, mm -hmm. which is really just their communication. Right. Um, so um, we do a lot of uh, reflection and um, we've developed the sort of zones of um, regulation where we have a bullseye and we teach kids what's a little bit of an uh-oh versus right. what's a big uncomfortable situation and what's a really significant problem. And we do a lot of mindfulness around let's have our actions match the scenario. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if a child breaks a pencil, 
and they're screaming and banging their head, we might say, well, screaming is appropriate if, it's, if you're in the red zone, where let's say you see grandma passed out on the floor, that's time to scream. Right. Um, but yeah. red zone means you need a 911 call, like an ambulance or a fire truck or a police car. Now mm -hmm. let's talk about that broken pencil. Do we need an ambulance? Do we need right. a fire truck? And the kids sort of giggle and realize yeah. that they've had this extreme reaction um, to their sensory overload. Yeah. So we are using a lot of cognition to work with kids to have a match between the level of stress and their response. Um, so That's the, amazing. It's, it's, it's Already what you're talking about, I feel like it has so much overlap with kind of the Montessori way of education as well. Like when, when we enroll children in a Montessori school, usually there's an extensive um, entry application talking about how your child handles transitions, about meal times, about what they eat, what they don't like, how they handle nap, what their preferences are. And then also what you're talking about, this like storyline, it's very much like our grace and courtesy lessons, you know, where we talk about what would you do in this situation? You know, here's something that you could do or what, you know, would this be appropriate? And asking a lot of questions to the children, it's, it sounds like a, you, you would do well with uh, some Montessori teachers on staff, too, if you don't already have some. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I, what I love about the Montessori is it's always about finding the just right place. Right. And so even with a toy, a child might be experimenting with putting cylinders in graduated, you know, columns or um, doing something with numbers and matching sets to numbers with a model there. And if it's too difficult and they start building with those blocks instead of ordering them by number, that's okay. Right. Because that's their just right place. Exactly. And they're learning as they're building, you know, that obviously the more you build, then there's numbers like bigger and taller, or concepts like bigger and taller. Right. And we always have an experience before more. the language. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So you're, you're using... Um, the physical toy with the language concept. And that's so much of what we do with our center. Even in teaching, we have a huge sensory gym. Most of our kids, I teach math on things like a swing or a trampoline. Mm -hmm. Because if you're just a visual learner, like so many of our kids on the spectrum are, you might know your numbers by the time you're two. But the meaning of 30 is more than five. You really feel it when you're jumping 30 times on the trampoline versus jumping five times on the trampoline. Oh, that's brilliant. You know, so yeah. that, that motor experience that, mm -hmm. that goes hand in hand yeah. with the Montessori philosophy of, Definitely. you know, experiential multisensory learning. Definitely. One thing I've wondered, because with Montessori education, we talk about following the child and going with you know the child's interest and pace and i feel that's something very important because we're all different we all learn at different paces we all have our you know our different ways that we take in knowledge like you're talking about visual some people very auditory and experiential etc um as a as a montessori teacher i often found that that parents would want to put their children that had more special needs into the class and I would want to help them as much as I could just in the normal frame of what I'd been taught uh, in my teacher training. But I felt like we really needed a little more special, a lot more special training on how to help these children. I think uh, definitely it's like, it's a very congruent educational method, but what do you, what do you usually recommend for educators to get that extra kind of sensitivity training to help children that, that would possibly be in our classrooms? Well, my favorite thing to do is to teach teachers what sensory processing really means. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times teachers are fanatical about sensory stimulation, mm -hmm. but they're not fanatical about sensory integration. And what I mean by that is, you know, sensory processing is really a three-step process of we take in information with our senses, you know, the five that you learn in kindergarten, but also vestibular sense and proprioception. Mm -hmm. So you're taking in that information in step one. And then step two is you're making sense of it. You're filing it with like information. You're recognizing patterns and connections. And then step three is the output. 
and what are you doing for an adaptive function? So it might be something like as simple as touch your nose, mm -hmm. auditory information gets translated and the child responds with touching nose, not mm -hmm. toes or not blowing their nose. Right. So they're hearing the verb, the noun, they make sense of it and then they do the job. But if you then break down all of the senses into how a child is learning, are they hypo or hyper responsive? Mm -hmm. And so when they take in information in a normal range or it like a hyper responsive child might hear a fire drill and cover their ears and scream. It's too much stimulation. Right. A hypo responsive child might hear that same fire drill and think, what, I'm playing with my dinosaurs. Where's everybody going? Right. And that noise means nothing to them until they learn that sound means put down the toy, line up, we're going outside. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at, this, at all of the senses and you observe someone in play, mm -hmm. you can start to see patterns. Are they a visual learner or is visual information that's all colorful and beautiful too overstimulating for them? Mm -hmm. And they're better off with one toy on the table and everything else put away. Um, and, and this also goes to, to the step two in the process, which is attention. And we have so many kids being diagnosed with attention deficit disorder when in fact people think it's about, they can't pay attention to anything. But the truth is most of those kids are paying attention to everything. Hmm. So it's hard to focus on putting the cylinders in the hole when there's a colorful Lego set behind you right. and you're taking in all of this information and you can't focus on the primary stimulus and ignore the background stimulus. So as we observe kids in play, it helps us to learn the sensory modalities that are their primary modalities. And not that we want to ignore anything that's not a strength for them, but we want to know the way in. Right. So if the way in is tactile, mm -hmm. then that child might learn to write their numbers um, in sand or, you know, with coffee beans or with, mm -hmm. you know, some, Some paper you, letters, maybe? you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, versus um, a child who's, um, who is hyper responsive to, or to tactile stimulation wouldn't want shaving cream on a tray to drag a finger through. Right. Like that would cause a visceral reaction for them. Mm -hmm. So we want to teach them to manage that by maybe starting with a popsicle stick in the shaving cream to expose them to new stimulus, but not as their primary learning modality. It's like teaching someone to walk a tightrope while you're teaching a new language at the same time. Like right. it's too much to manage. So. Mm -hmm. Analyzing play and analyzing the sensory components that are the strong ones is the way the way in, so to speak. That's your road in, mm -hmm. and that's not to say, you know, where are you? Where are you at? What is your level right now? And observing, observing first, and watching what the child naturally does, and then finding a way to invite a new challenge or a new way yeah. of, of working with something. That's fabulous. I just, I love the concept of your center and what you're doing there. It just sounds like there's so much positive progress for both the children and the families. And then I'm curious about, you know, when, when you start to change the diet, I mean, it's, it sounds like it's different per, per child and per family, but do you find kind of a, like a general shift in diets that you would recommend against or for? Well, Clearly, we want to teach children what the word food means. Mm -hmm. I think we need to take the concept of junk food and throw that away because we're using the word food with junk. Right. Uh, you know, and that's like saying healthy cancer. Um, you know, it, <laughs> yeah, right. it, there's food and that's things that are alive and grow. So I love teaching kids to eat a rainbow. Mm -hmm. I love glass containers and having you know carrot strips and pepper strips and strawberries and blueberries and you mm -hmm. know snap peas and and just saying okay let's take our rainbow placemat and put mm -hmm. some food on it of all the colors and talk mm -hmm. about it growing and giving gratitude to the farmers that grew this and to the soil and to the earth 
and getting um, kids to understand that food is that which grows. Yeah, and that's a very that, that, yeah, yeah. It makes it make a huge difference when we're using gogurts that have no live culture or that have so much sugar in it. Right. It negates the the good stuff that that you know the the acidophilus and the yogurt or we're calling them fruit roll-ups and it's like genetically modified corn syrup, whatever. Right. Um, like I think it's okay to teach kids that that's another word, maybe crap yeah. and we don't eat crap and we need food. And, but to say junk food is right. just insane. Um, and so I really like to teach kids about food as it relates to how did it grow so mm -hmm. that they can connect to things that are living yeah. Um, and healthy fats like avocado and, you know, those kinds of food. Um, I love when my kids came home from school, they'd sometimes say, I wish we could go to the neighbor's house after school. They've got cookies all over the counter and Oreos and mm -hmm. whatever. And, and those kids would say, well, I want to go to your house because your mom's always got something hot on the counter. And I would just slice up like, for example, maybe sweet potatoes. Mm-hmm on a mandolin and put them in the oven with a little squirt of olive oil and mm -hmm. have that on the counter. I wouldn't even take it off the, the cookie sheet and they'd just be gone and eat them like potato chips. Wonderful. Um, you know, or just put out a big bowl of blueberries or make a silly face out of berries and mm -hmm. whatever, you know, banana slices and right. a smile or something mm -hmm. and have the um, peel it and touch it and wash it and think about the plant that it came from. And, um, you know, I have four kids and they're super healthy. We, we've never really used medication or mm -hmm. we've used some homeopathy and oils and herbs, but for the most part, no one's ever, um, been sick. That's fabulous. And, um, so that was a really nice way to boost the immune system. And when they were having issues like, um, a hard time studying, for example, let's say they were in high school, mm -hmm. um, I might say, okay, let's get some spirulina into your body. Let's nice. get some green. How about some wheatgrass? That's a great pH for your gut that will help you, the dinner tonight really absorb for your brain food. Mm -hmm. Let's go high protein for this week. Right. Um, it makes me crazy when I see the school nurse write a note home and say, we're testing this week. Please give your child a healthy breakfast. Mm -hmm. Other 179 school days aren't as important. You know? Right, right. You know, so like don't eat Fruit Loops one day a year because we're testing tomorrow. <laughs> what? Yeah, but um, interesting that they, they did notice that the breakfast was important. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> notice you that you, when you eat a more substantial breakfast or lunch that your, your brain is working better. I remember we did um, a class once at, um, at the Maui Business Center, and you had shown us this, uh, it was uh, in a book, and it was a research after like even spraying tables with Clorox and yes. how that affected the brains. Even to be careful with your cleaning products is important. Absolutely. Um, the, that work came from a wonderful researcher named Doris Rapp, R-A-P-P, and she wrote two textbooks that I refer to a lot. One is called, Is This Your Child? Mm -hmm. And the other is, Is This Your Child's World? And the first one has to do with um, food allergies. And the second one has to do with environmental chemical allergies. Mm -hmm. And um, she looked at handwriting samples and test scores and drawings of uh, a draw a person test. Mm -hmm. um, pre and post exposure to a toxin. Uh -huh. So if the um, maybe the school exterminator had been there, right. or or the um, janitorial staff wiped down the tables with Clorox, and they would look at this the difference in performance when toxins entered the brain, and um, you know, and that's a huge issue with with all of our learners is that right. our environment now is being poisoned, our food, our water, you know, our vaccines, you know, we all want vaccines for public health and they're so important mm -hmm. for public health. Right. Um, but just like we don't want toxins in our food, we don't want mercury, aluminum and formaldehyde in our, you know, in our vaccines. So right. it becomes 
we want public health and we want, um, you know, but, and it, it's a real concern because it has a, a huge disruption in that chemical reaction, it, their neurotoxins and any neurotoxin is going to have an effect on the efficiency of learning. Right. And it's also crossing that blood brain barrier and staying there for, yes. for life. Yeah. It's a huge concern. Definitely. So I don't know if you have any idea, how can we get that vaccine without the metal? Is it possible? You know, it's almost like we need the whole foods in the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Um, but you know, it's, it's more um, financially beneficial and for, and for safety. Like we want to know that we have, vaccines in warehouses should we have a bioterrorism issue or whatever right. um, and so preservatives become really important so it's right. finding that perfect balance and I think Robert Kennedy is doing a good job right now if you look at his work in Washington um, of coming up with a middle-of-the-road solution because you know, right. public health is really important and, and I think most people who call themselves anti-vaxxers mm -hmm. are really not Anti public health, right? Just want a healthier version, right? Just like a person might buy a, um, a a cereal for their child that's not genetically modified and not covered in pesticides. It's the same yeah. kind of theory. So it's not Absolutely. just what we eat, but anything that we put in and on our body. And as you said, household cleaners and lotions, right. and shampoos, and all of that. Right. Yeah, I I know that the the more I learn about healthy lifestyle, the more factors I find out affect us. I mean, <laughs> like, it's really, it's really coming from all sides. And I, I know as for me as a mother, I'm really trying to teach my children to be stewards of the earth and, and trying to teach them where food is coming from. Currently, we're, we're traveling to some of the most beautiful places in the country. And just, you know, sharing with them, you know, when we're eating the food, where does it come from? You know, who's growing it? How can we give right. back? How can we make sure that this earth stays, you know, beautiful for the, for the future? And it's really like, you know, we have to be so protective and so careful because there's stuff in the air, there's stuff in the water, there's stuff in the food. <laughs> like you, right. you know, and, and oftentimes even labels or are, are, things are mislabeled in the grocery stores. And unless you're aware of it, you're, you're putting that in your body. So it's definitely... Good to be aware, but also not paranoid. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's nice that you're traveling and you can bring in um, regional foods and what's grown here, right. or how far did this have to fly for us to enjoy, you know, a pineapple in January if you're yeah. in Vermont. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And for us, really we have a lot of chats about watermelons. <laughs> 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So true. Yeah. Exactly. How far did it go? It would be a neat little storybook to show them, like, how, how far did your food travel today to get to your table? Yeah, there's a book for you. Right? You know, oh, I have a whole list of children's books that I want to write. But not this year, not when we're on the road. <laughs> slowly, slowly. Right. My food well, on a plane. Exactly. Tell me, Susan, when I first met you, you were talking about creating an app for parents. Did you, is that still in the works? Did you... You know, I, um, it's in the works, but it's not complete. What I would like to do is take my entire curriculum for applied behavioral analysis, which is a way to break down skills into their smallest parts and have that curriculum um, be available through an easy app. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of the issue with that is that our learners are so individualized Right. It seems like the project that never ends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, for example, I was just working on the math curriculum and so many of our kids can count, can put numbers in order, whether mm -hmm. they're tiles or puzzle pieces or on paper. Um, and then many of our learners, especially kids who have been diagnosed with Asperger's who have such a strong auditory mm -hmm. system, but not a strong visual system. Mm -hmm. um, they can memorize flashcards easily. Okay. So they know that four plus three is seven, but they can't visualize it. So huh. when I say, well, tell me about seven, can, how does that break up into like one plus six and two plus five? And they can't visualize that. They can only recite what their eyes have seen on a 
flashcard. So then I'm like, hmm, I need to write a curriculum for that. And so I just did one where you're just identifying clusters by, by vision, like rolling a dice right. without counting the five dots, seeing the pattern and knowing visually five. Okay. And then roll a two and a five without counting, just seeing which has more, which is a bigger number. Mm -hmm. Where does that fall in the number line? Like tactilely putting it in order. Mm -hmm. um, this, so this is one of the reasons why it takes me forever because for yeah. every skill, I think about the tactile learner, the visual learner, the proprioceptive learner, <laughs> the auditory learner, right. and it becomes a, a daunting task, but I'm still that's, on it. That's awesome. And would the app be, uh, the child would be interactive with the app on an iPad or something, or is it something to teach the parents yeah, so something for, to... The parent interact. would have the curriculum, and then it ha would have a corresponding game, and the games would be errorless, so that there's no opportunity to make a mistake. Wow. Until it's mastered. So if it's, for example, if it said touch two, there mm -hmm. would only be two on the screen until they mastered that. And then there might be a distractor like a, a, a two with a three mm -hmm. or a two with a five. And so mm -hmm. then they're finding two and discriminating and then moving to sets. And Wonderful. so there'd be games that would be built in and they would only progress when the child was able to master it in a multi-sensory way. Sounds so, brilliant. Sounds like a, a brilliant. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think we'll all be excited about that when it comes out. Mm -hmm. I think for any child, it sounds like it would be a great program for, for any young learner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just a holistic approach to breaking down, you know, academic skills. That's fabulous. Wonderful. Um, so I want to go back a little bit because we, a lot of my listeners were, were working on learning homeschooling approaches or just kind of finding some tips for the, when, even if our children are going to school, like what to do on the weekends or after school that can really help our learners. Can you think of some holistic, holistic uh, approaches that, to parenting that you would, you would recommend for some of our parents? Sure. Um, I'm pretty fanatical about literature-based approaches, mm. um, and I really like, um, you know, nonfiction for kids, meaning, yeah. and it's sort of a, almost like a Fred Rogers approach. So, you know, if you're talking about apples, mm -hmm. you know, the Sesame Street approach would be apples, A, avalanche, boom, it's gone, you know, and then yeah. you're like, what are we talking about? And then they're right. on to the next thing. So instead of that, more the Mr. Rogers approach of, okay, let's go to the farm. Let's look at these seeds going into the ground, watch mm -hmm. the apple tree grow, turn the page. Let's look at the blossoms. They smell really sweet. Where does the fruit come from? And how mm -hmm. does that blossom become the fruit? And then when do we pick it? And, yeah. you know, um, and then moving into the cider, the pie, the raw fruit, the cooked fruit, this, the applesauce that we steam, mm -hmm. you know, and, then, and then going to an orchard and cooking together and just bringing it all in a multi-sensory way. It sounds simple, but I think we, you know, we get busy looking at silly character books and kids get hooked on Dora the Explorer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, some of those all have great messages, mm -hmm. but parents can go real simple with like how-to books. Right. Um, you know, do kids know that when mommy makes a cup of tea that that's actually a plant? Right. Most mm -hmm. kids don't. If I say to a four-year-old, where does tea come from? They say a tea bag. You know, um, not even understanding that you can mm -hmm. grow that and dry it out and put mm -hmm. it in a piece of cloth and create a, a tincture. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Called, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. So I love that kind of learning, that hands-on, or taking a piece of wood, and you know, cutting it to different lengths, and just talking about longer and shorter. Right. And how many do we have to put together to get one to be this long? Mm -hmm. you know, again, not numbers, not a ruler, but just objects in in nature. Um, mm -hmm. You know, collecting sticks or stones or. Um, you know, making patterns and 
And then, you know, if they're learning patterns with rock stick, rock stick, they can bring that into the kitchen and, Ooh. you know, how can we make a pattern with this, uh, you know, cheese and tomato and put it uh-huh. on a skewer or this melon and this strawberry and put mm-hmm. it on a skewer and make patterns and, and sort of bring the learning from the farm to the table, from the numbers, the counting, the concepts more you know, gratitude, all of those mm-hmm. pieces can, you know, thanking the farmer, thanking the soil, thanking the sun, right? holding the food, mm-hmm. feeling the vibration of the food. But we mindfully sit in front of the TV with a bowl of popcorn <laughs> and we miss out on everything about the corn plant and, right. and how it all happened. And so mm-hmm. I like simple activities like that. I think simple is better. Yeah. Um, and just mindful ways to um, teach kids to, to grow and eat, to, um, to count and stack and, and learn concepts, to um, do lots of turn taking and, and do, um, have lots of reinforcement about waiting and watching others. Mm-hmm. And what are they doing that's different from you and appreciating differences? And so you can weave kindness and patience Mm -hmm. and gratitude and all of these concepts into early childhood curriculum without calling it gratitude day or right appreciation day but just part of your daily life yeah right just infusing infusing the good stuff into the concepts wherever wherever you can Mm -hmm. and all it takes is a little bit of mindfulness you know how can i make this multi-sensory how can i put this into a group um, where I can um, talk about, you know, a simple book about the apple orchard, but then come up with a thousand and one ideas about the apple, you know, right. the cooking, whatever. And one thing I like to be mindful of, and um, and I believe Montessori is, mm-hmm. is many many teachers in preschool use food as sensory materials. Mm-hmm cut an apple and make a print or yep. put rice in a table for uh-huh. sensory play, tactile play. Mm-hmm. And considering our nation's poverty level, um, I like to avoid that because that same rice that we're sweeping up because it's fallen on the floor could very easily be a meal for a family right. that's really um, in poverty. So I like to teach children about um, the gratitude around food. Mm-hmm. Uh, use it as a, uh, a sponge painting device or, you know, I've seen teachers take potatoes or apples and make prints on paper. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, I know kids that would wish, hope and pray for a fresh organic apple. Right. Um, so I'd like to just teach kids to be mindful of, of cultural and socioeconomic differences mm-hmm. Um, and I know there's a program in Indiana that's sending home all of the cafeteria food at the end of the day that used to be thrown out and packaging it up and getting kids to send love notes with it and having families, kids take it home to families that are, would not ordinarily have a meal. Wow. That's wonderful. And I think it's important because we're so into this. I don't want it. I'll throw it away. I'm mm-hmm. done it away um but maybe it could go in a compost bin or for right. your garden or to chickens or to make the eggs yeah. or, you know their food right. or whatever and that's um, something i like about montessori like our school in maui they were composting everything they had chickens they had their own living garden and the children were participating from toddler up through middle school i so love that wonderful yeah very conscious even our school picnics we had to bring our own utensils and and plates and all reusable things. They weren't going to provide something that was just going to be thrown away after. And I just, I really appreciated that so much. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're doing um, here on Maui. There's more and more restaurants that have no paper napkins, all cloth. Right. Um, you're invited to bring your own utensils. They have some. There's absolutely no to-go containers in many of the restaurants anymore. You can purchase one for ten dollars and bring it back and get your ten dollars back or cool. bring your own. Nice. I brought platters and salad bowls to restaurants for to go orders. That's um and that's becoming more and more popular for sustainability. Yeah. Like, 
amazing. I really, I would like to see that sweep all the states. It's been quite an eye-opening experience for me as I cross the country to see where we do or do not see recycling bins, for instance. And I, I've been kind of like keeping everything with me. If we don't see the recycling bins, my my family laughs a little. But I, you know, I keep it until I until I find a place to dispose of it properly that I know that it's going to be recycled like it needs to be. That's something Absolutely. we talk about and a lot. You, you know, if the more we walk into stores with our own cup and say, can you please fill this? Yeah. Um, the and more the next thing. person online is going to overhear and decide they want to do that too. Right. And, you know, even if you do that three or four days a week, that's going to multiply. Yeah. And then those three or four people will do it three or four days a week. And, and then you have a movement. Exactly. And you know, things like going in with chopsticks or bamboo utensils or, you know, reusable right. napkins. and Simple you know, we, stuff that we can all do and do our part. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've eliminated at our center in New York, um, we've eliminated all plastic utensils, cups. We have our own that we wash and, you right. know, using bamboo and having the kids put it outside, you know, China's no longer taking our plastic recycles. So yeah. it's all right. Right. We've got wow. to find better ways. It's so true. I love all your tips and all your ideas. And it just, it's like makes my heart monastery heart so happy to hear all the <laughs> things that you're introducing. Thank you so much for taking time for our Montessori talks episode. I really appreciate it. And for oh, you're very welcome. Wonderful. And for, for those interested in, in finding your book, I'll put that in the comments and I'll have a link for your, for your centers as well. And Terrific. Those of, yeah. And those of you parents who, uh, who are working hard with their children, when you come to Maui, you can get some treatments with, with uh, Susan as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Aloha.